Unless you've been living in a cave, you know that an election is coming up in America. Even if you don't pay much attention to politics, surely you've noticed the 8,000 political handbills you get in the mail every single day. It is exhausting. It's also the best time to talk about how Seventh-day Adventists relate to voting. This is going to be fun. So how do Adventists vote? That's a tough question. Fundamentally, Adventists reflect the traditional apoliticalness of Protestantism. Our posture towards political participation in general has been one of wariness. In the earliest days of the church, there was a strong feeling against voting. Jesus was going to come soon. What's the point? One of our church's founders sums up the feeling on voting pretty well. Quote, if a brother chooses to vote, we cannot condemn him, and we want the same liberty if we do not, end quote. One gets the impression that the default position of the church was that voting wouldn't do much good. But if you want to vote, go do it. It's just a personal choice. Just don't get caught up in what James White called the spirit of the coming contest. He was referring to an election year. In other words, vote if you want, but don't be a political partisan. That doesn't mean Adventists had weak political views. The first generations of Seventh-day Adventists coming of age in antebellum America had exceptionally strong and radical views about war and slavery. Regarding the 1860 presidential election, James White also wrote, Those of our people who voted at all at the last presidential election to a man voted for Abraham Lincoln. We know of not one man among Seventh-day Adventists who has the least sympathy for secession. Now, we can tell... Two things from this statement. First, the hesitation to vote. James White was speaking of those of our people who voted at all, implying that many didn't vote. The second thing we can learn here is the strong feelings Adventists had towards slavery and secession. Just because all Adventists didn't vote doesn't mean that they didn't care. In fact, they cared deeply. Adventists were counted among the most radical abolitionists in America at that time. Let me give you an example. In 1859, another radical abolitionist named John Brown tried to ignite a slave rebellion by attacking a federal arsenal in Virginia. He failed, of course, but some Adventists were amused by his foolishness, just kind of making fun of him. But Ellen White, one of the church's founders, was not amused. She told them, Brown's motives were all right. His sympathies were aroused for the cruel treatment of the slaves, and that led him to make the move he did to secure for them what our Declaration of Independence says all men are entitled to, liberty. Now that's bold, considering the southern states at that time considered Brown's attack something like an act of terrorism. But Adventists felt very strongly about these issues, even if they didn't often turn to political activism to achieve those goals. Now, just after the Civil War ended in 1865, Adventists considered the question of voting again. Church leaders opened the door on voting a little bit more. They wrote, In our judgment, the act of voting when exercised in behalf of justice, humanity, and right is in itself blameless and may yet sometimes be proper, but the casting of any vote that shall strengthen the cause of such crimes as intemperance, insurrection, and slavery we regard as highly criminal in the sight of heaven but we would deprecate any participation in the spirit of party strife. Voting took on a moral weight as Adventists looked at voting as a way to support or oppose important issues. So Adventists should not be party partisans. Ellen White, many years later, echoed these principles when she said, Keep your voting to yourself! Do not feel it your duty to urge everyone to do as you do. Now, when it came to certain moral issues, however, Ellen White said it was the duty of Adventists to vote, even if that vote were on Sabbath. To summarize, Adventists believe voting is a good practice if it is in behalf of justice, humanity, and right. It is a bad practice if it supports the moral crimes of slavery and temperance and so on. If you vote, keep it to yourself. Don't try to campaign to bring everyone around to see things the way you do. And don't get caught up in party politics. Let me try to flesh those things out for you. If... if I had to explain the traditional Adventist view of voting to someone, I would maybe start like this. Number one, Jesus is the only hope for the world, and his return is soon. Our job as Adventists is to preach the gospel, and we must not be distracted by lesser pursuits. Good is the enemy of great, and all of that. Number two, your vote matters. You have to answer before God someday over how you used your vote, or perhaps didn't use your vote. What kind of world you helped create with your vote? That's the kind of question you have to tell, you have to answer before God someday. And when no good options are available, it's okay not to vote. Third, vote, even on Sabbath, when you can advance the cause of Jesus, which the early Adventist church described, again, as in behalf of justice, 
humanity and right. And of course, the specific issues they had in mind were the prohibition of alcohol and the ending of slavery, but I think we can prayerfully and conscientiously consider what issues today meet the definition of justice, humanity, and right. Fourth, don't get sucked into partisan politics or parties. The goal is to use political mechanisms to advance the cause of Jesus, not to be used by those political mechanisms. I remember when I was pastoring in Iowa, a big early election state, a 2016 presidential candidate contacted me and asked if I'd be willing to host a small gathering in my home with the candidate and some of my church members. I said I was uncomfortable using my position as a pastor to bring members to this party so that he could try to win their votes. They saw me as a vote bundler, as someone who has influence over dozens or perhaps hundreds of church members, and they wanted to make me feel special so that I would deliver my members' votes to them. Now, maybe if circumstances were different, I might have agreed, okay? I'm not trying to tell you what is right or what is wrong here. I'm just offering this as an example of how the political machines will try to use you. The good news in this story is that I said no, and instead the candidate took me and some other local pastors out to lunch. I'm pretty sure they looked at it as an opportunity to win the votes of Christian leaders in that area, and I looked at it as an opportunity to chat with the candidate and get a free lunch. Okay, uh, last one, five, no, penultimate one, five. Don't insist that your view of politics is the only correct view. Have some humility. Six, while there are some moral issues we should all unify around, in general, keep your voting record to yourself. I think the goal here was to avoid needless fights in our church over our political identities. It's like the people who put big flags on their pickup trucks announcing to the world who they support for president. It's a polarizing practice. It'll make some people cheer for you and it'll tempt other people to vandalize your vehicle. That flag on your truck essentially announces, if you don't know me, this is who I am, as if your political identity is the one that matters the most. Early Adventists would be horrified by that, I think. Uh, our whole goal is to preach the gospel, so why would I put up a flag that leads half of the country to write me off and tune me out? I am first and foremost a child of God. That spiritual identity must be stronger than every other identity. My identity as a man, as a white person, as a Republican or Democrat or whatever, okay? Those are the principles as I see them. Circumstances can change things, to be sure. They're not all absolutes. The civil rights movement, I would say, would be one occasion where we might go all in, an occasion where maintaining this posture of distance and neutrality would be wrong. But in the main, I think it served Adventists very well. And I should add that just because these principles are old doesn't mean they're all right. It doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to have a discussion about how we can faithfully and righteously relate to politics. These days, the Adventist Church is probably the most racially and politically diverse church in America. Couldn't be prouder of that. In 2015, Pew Research surveyed the political leanings of Adventists and found that 45% identified as Democrats or lean Democrat, 35% were Republican or leaned Republican, 19% were independent, which is, which is a mythical unicorn group these days. That matches a survey of 1,600 Adventists, which a pair of left-leaning Adventist magazines did after the 2016 election. They found that 32% considered themselves Democrats, 28% Republicans, and 29% Independents. Even in this age of deep polarization, Democrats and Republicans worship together in Adventist pews. This was the goal of the Adventist founders, pursue purely moral purposes in politics without getting sucked into the machinery. Voting is not evil. There are clear and important issues of morality and justice and humanity that we have an obligation to pursue. But politics is not always clear, and so we don't judge each other based on how we vote. The Adventist tradition of voting tries to keep these several principles in tension. It's not always an easy task. We have plenty of moments in our own history where we have failed to live up to them. But let's continue to be a church that can worship together, a church where we see each other fundamentally as fellow children of God, one new humanity, and let us keep educating and encouraging one another to vote on behalf of righteousness and humanity. Thank you.